Hello, and welcome to the Shortgun Sportsman, a podcast about handgun hunting brought to you by Handgun Hunters International. My name is Ryan Hoover, and I'm your host. I believe handgun hunting is the most rewarding way to hunt, and it's something I want to share with as many people as I can. If you are at all interested in getting your own game meat, I want to challenge you to a way of hunting that is good for both your spirit and your body so you can become the confident, self-reliant person you were meant to be. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Short Gun Sportsman. Today, I have a good one. Tank Hoover, who is a, besides having a really cool last name, is a uh, well-known author. He writes for American Handgunner, Guns Magazine, uh, basically FMG Publications. He's been doing it for a while. If you don't follow him on social media, you should because he's just always got some very interesting content. But before we get into that interview, I just want to make a plea that if you are interested in handgun hunting, please reach out to us. I run an organization called Handgun Hunters International, but you becoming a member of that is secondary to me. You becoming a handgun hunter is really what it's all about. So if you have any questions, if you're at all interested in it, please reach out to me. If I don't know the answer, I probably know someone who does. You can go check out handgunhuntersinternational.com if you want to see what we're about there. Of course, we'd love to have you join if you are interested, but don't feel pressure to join if you're interested in becoming a handgun hunter. Just reach out to us. You can email me at ryan at handgunhuntersinternational.com and and uh, I'd love to I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to just see what you're thinking. And uh, maybe there's a way we can help you get into the sport. So think about it. All right. I hope you all enjoy my interview with Tank Hoover. Tank Hoover, thank you so much for agreeing to do the podcast with me today. I really appreciate it. Hey, I'm happy to be here, Ryan. Yeah, so it's it's great to talk to just kind of a classic gun crank as I as I always read about him uh, in the past, and I know just following you on social media, you got your fingers into everything. Handguns are not just you're like I said, you're just a gun crank, and I and you're always very entertaining. All the things you do are very entertaining and informative. But um, just because we could probably talk forever, and this is a handgun hunting podcast, can you kind of tell me? Like, what is your path or what was your path for into handgun hunting uh, and, and kind of some of your favorite experiences about that? Uh, I, Ryan, I probably started like most guys. Um, you know, I started out hunting uh, groundhogs as a kid. I, I got my first uh, bolt action rifle at the age of eight, a Harrington and Richardson uh, Plainsman. And I had a scope. Uh, Got into deer hunting around age 12. Uh, had a scoped uh, Remington 700. The rifle started accumulating and there are bold actions. And then I was pretty successful. And then like everybody else, you start wanting to get a challenge. So then I started going to iron sighted lever guns, single shot rifles, then muzzle loaders. And then along came the handgun. And this brought me up about, oh, I don't know, mid, mid to late 80s, like everyone else reading Ross Safe our articles. And it just, you know, something really caught my attention there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, also by reading Ross Safe uh casting my own bullets and hand loading followed because I just thought it, I'm like a true do it yourself. If, if I can do it, to put myself in the hunt as much as I can, that's what I like doing. And that included, you know, handloading my ammunition. And then the next step, of course, was just making my own bullets. And you just get a lot of self-satisfaction from that. And, again, as you challenge yourself with the uh, harder uh, guns to use, you get that satisfaction. It just ups the level. And with uh, the handgun, I took my first animal out in Idaho in 2009 and that started out it was around 2009 that I got on the internet and we were uh, uh, I was a county cop at the time and we had to go to an email class and I'm like oh my god I don't want to learn about this computer stuff I'm not a computer geek and <laughs> we had a really good instructor and she said I'm going to show you how to get online and you guys can surf the web for a half hour, just put in Google, whatever interests you, and it's going to open up a world to you. 
And so, of course, I started putting in gun stuff. And next thing you know, I, I got on the gun broker. And by the end of that time, I had two bids on a couple of guns. <laughs> and uh, so it just carried on. And then I, I got into, you know, the gun forums, Ruger Forum and singleactions.com. Mm-hmm. And I kept noticing this guy popping up. He was killing all the stuff from from badgers to elk to bear to deer and it was Dick Thompson, you know, the famous six shot. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this guy's the real deal. And it was during the same time my mom was uh, dying of cancer. So that was my reprieve. I'd come home from work late at night, rip my vest off, sit down at the computer to unwind. And I'd go to the Ruger forum and, and read about the annex of Dick Thompson. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got to talking you know, through the internet, and uh, he invited me to an elk hunt out in uh, Idaho, and I'd always been a little apprehensive about going out west, because I knew as soon as I saw the Rocky Mountains, I was going to fall in love, and I wouldn't want to go back home. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened, and I got out there, and I was like, this is unbelievable. I'm, I'm here in the land of Elmer Keith, and, uh, you know, hunting with Dick Thompson, and Glenn Swagger, and a couple other guys, and uh, we had a heck of a time, and like I said, I, I got my first handgun kill. It was a cow elk, and I was using a uh, Ruger Bisley 45 Colt, hand loaded with, of course, a uh, 454 424 Keith bullet because I was in the land of Elmer. Mm-hmm. Loaded over 20 grains of uh, 2400, and that load goes out. I don't know, mid twelve fifty or so, and uh, elk was about it was a laser at one hundred and twenty one yards, and I got a nice broadside shot, double lunger, and at the shot she swung her head around, bit at the entrance, like she was stung by a bee, took three wobbly steps and fell over. Wow! And I thought, holy heck! <laughs> I mean, a rifle couldn't have did better than that, and I was like, it just. I was in awe. I was in shock and awe. I just couldn't believe it. You know, that was the start. And then uh, that was like in early November. And then Maryland firearm season started. And I was fortunate enough. That I got I got a buck and a doe on opening day at Maryland. And then Pennsylvania, I went. I got a buck with the handgun. It's like I had a great start. Yeah, sounds like and, it. You know, just, <laughs> it, you know, it. I, I couldn't have been happier. And then I had access to a lot of properties. And, you know, of course, I was, like I said, I was a uh, police officer then. So it was a lot easier to get permission to hunt on places. And, and guys warned me, they said, well, when you retire, you're going to see who's really your friends and who's not. <laughs> and uh, when I retired, a lot of my hunting spots dried up. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's been a struggle, uh, you know, finding a decent place. And then, you know, I, I'm not a purist handgun hunter. I, I love it, but I also love my rifles and muzzle loaders. And, you know, I, I take them out for walks too. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, the guys that are, the guys that are the purest, I, you know, I, I have the utmost respect for them because you're limited, you know, with your shots and range. And, you know, a lot of times you want to go home from the hunt, you know, with a tag and, you know, after a few years of that, you just start, you know, you want to, you want to kill something. So, oh, yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's funny, you know, like th- talking about the purest philosophy, I've, I've always kind of been, I guess you could say anti saying, because you could, you could get into the weeds about what is purest because even handgun hunters who don't hunt with rifles have disagreements about what, what pure hand, you know, like if somebody shoots a right. scoped XP 100, right. there is somebody who doesn't think that's handgun hunting because it's a, you know, basically a rifle without a stock. I'm doing air quotes here, which I, you know, for me, you know, how far are you going to take that? You know, is it, you have to right. use iron sights and then is it, you know, well, I use a knife. Well, I use a rock, you know, how, how are you going to get into purist? Right. And, and so I, I think it's totally cool. Like be having varied interest and, you know, I still consider you oh, a handgun absolutely. hunter. Yeah. You know, we got to get over the pettiness of, of, of that, you know, as hunters, we got to stick together because Lord knows the anti hunters, you know, they, 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 stick together on everything and you know the semantics of what weapon you use or gun you use uh, has no bearing right. um i i love all guns. <laughs> you know, I, 
guys say, well, what a, you know, it, it, it kind of gets my goes where, you know, guys will knock Glocks or any other uh, poly frame striker fired gun. But, you know, I, I love shooting those too. I mean, every gun's got its place and purpose. Amen. And uh, they're all a lot of fun. I, I enjoy it. And I'm not going to limit my fun by just shooting one type of gun. I'm going to shoot them all. Well said. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm, and my philosophy has always been, especially, you know, with, with HHI, with Handgun Hunters International, we say, you know, if no matter if you only handgun hunt or you handgun hunt and you also hunt with a rifle, whatever legal and ethical means you choose to use, if you're hunting with one of the modern guns or if you're you know more traditionalist single action revolver type hunter there is room for you under our tent because as you say we got to stick together and and hunters as a big group for sure uh, but handgun hunters we we're 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 kind of a small group and uh so it's yeah. even more important for us for sure and it's you know the same with archery you know you have the the mm-hmm. longbow society versus you know the compound and the crossbows and it's just exactly it, we just need to stick together and, yeah. and use it. The main thing is, you know, we're out there in the field enjoying it. Couldn't agree more. But moving into some choices, I'm curious when you do uh, pick up a handgun to go hunting, what are the what are the types that you gravitate for gravitate towards rather t- to go hunting with? I tell you, I have an immense respect and love for the uh, Ruger Bisley hunters. I think. Mm-hmm. You get the biggest bang for your buck with that gun, and you can shoot it with iron sights when your eyes go bad, or if you want, you can put a scope on it very easily. And it's funny what what I've always found that when I put a scope on a handgun, I don't like seeing how much wobble I actually have because <laughs> right. it's magnified. And when you have iron sights, you don't notice it as much. And you know when you it, it seems like I'm quicker on target and I'm, I'm more apt to squeeze the trigger quicker than, you know, with the scope trying to keep those crosshairs rock steady. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's and, very true. But I, I also enjoy, you know, using the iron sights because it's just, it's more of a challenge and I just feel more self-fulfilled for myself if I take something with iron sights. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and like I said, if, if guys want to use scope, that that's fine because it's, Really, in, in my opinion, a scope's almost a hindrance because mm. you just see that wobble there. Mm. You know, it's just it, it's hard. Yeah. And plus, it's you know it's harder to pack the gun in and out. You know the woods and you know the whole you have to get special holsters and yeah yeah there definitely is an added whatnot, level so. of equipment and stuff. Yeah. For that, uh, well, it, it makes sense. You know, right? You're I've I've seen a lot of your stuff about uh, casting bullets and powder coating, making your own mold, stuff like that. Really fascinating stuff, and that like falls right in line with the a single action iron sided revolver for hunting. I enjoy the, you know, the older tradition, I guess you'd say, you know, air quotes, you know, like you said, the traditional aspect, mm-hmm. but you know, there's a lot of the, the modern stuff. And really, if you look like the younger guys, they might start with the modern stuff. Like they might start with, you know, a poly framed gun. Mm-hmm. You see them at the range and then they see the old grandpa's, you know, a guy like me, you know, I'm shooting single actions or, or double action revolvers, and they get curious, like, "Hey, what's that?" And then I'm like, "Hey, you want to try it?" You yeah. know, this is this is where it started, and you know, they get drawn to it, and they shoot it, and they're like, "Wow, that's neat!" And, and I can't say how many people I've seen that I've encouraged, or you could say corrupted, but uh, <laughs> you know, then a couple months later, you see them, they have their own revolvers, which is great. Absolutely, yeah, that works with. You know, inline muzzle loaders. They mm-hmm. start out with that, and after shooting that, there's like, hey, there's no, you know, myth, mystical magic involved. It's pretty basic and simple. And then they look into the black powder, and next thing you know, they're they're shooting side hammer um, muzzle loaders. So yeah. it's just, I think it's kind of there's a human aspect that you want to kind of go back to, the, you know, what started it. So that, yeah, that's that's a good point. Absolutely. So that that segues into a good um, an, a, another question that I always ask for people who are experienced shooters and or hunters. If someone, if you meet someone who knows about handgun hunting and and they ask you, you know, I'm I'm interested in trying this out. What is what is the first thing you're going to tell them to do? What's the first piece of advice? I would say <laughs> be prepared to pass on shots because mm. it. it 
you're not going to be able to take that 150, 200 yard poke that you take with a scoped rifle mm -hmm. that was easy. I mean, most hunters can, can take that shot and, and be successful. But with a handgun, I mean, you're going to start out, your, your actual uh, effective distance might only be 25, 30 yards. And, you know, it'll extend over time. And, and you got to practice. And, you know, going back to Dick Thompson, he, has, he had a saying that I love repeating. He said, you never master the handgun. You need to practice with it every day. It's a gun of uh, diminishing skills in that if you don't pick it up and shoot it, dry fire it, your, your skills are just going to diminish. Mm -hmm. And you need to stay up with it. Whereas... Most guys I know, I mean, they, you know, that rifle hunt, they can shoot a rifle, set it down, pick it up, you know, a week before hunting season, make sure it's sighted and that's all they do. And, you know, that's it. They, they don't have to practice. Whereas to be a handgun hunter, you have to, it's like archery too. You have to be dedicated and you have to practice to, to be effective. That's, that's, I'm glad to hear you say that. And that is kind of a different perspective than some of the other guys who've been doing it for a long time have said, have told me, however, you know, usually the answer to the first piece of advice is get yourself a 22. But I like mm -hmm. where you, I like where you're going with that in that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're kind of saying, listen, you got to mentally prepare if you're going to jump into this because it's oh, not absolutely. just, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like running a marathon. You, you're not going to say, okay, I'm going to run a marathon and then sit on the couch for a year. Right. <laughs> and do it, you, you just, you're not going to complete it. Whereas, you know, if you get out there and you start running a couple miles and then every week you increase by a mile or two and then, you know, build up to it, the, the hits will be, become natural. They'll be easy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as far as, you know, handguns, I mean, starting out, sure. I mean, I, I'm big for If I can't shoot, I'll, I'll pick a gun up and I'll, I'll just start, you know, snapping at something on the wall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's, that's better than nothing. So. Right. Absolutely. I, my eight year old daughter killed her first deer this year. And in addition, oh, awesome. yeah, it was so great. And in addition to, um, the, you know, going to the range and practicing, she, she was shooting a 223 contender pistol. And mm -hmm. it, so in addition to going to the range and practicing, we would dry fire on, deer videos like we would watch deer videos yep. and dry fire or i would pause it and have my kids go up and point to where you're going to aim and all that stuff so right there's a lot of work that can be done and that needs to be done outside of the live firing range of course you want to make sure that your gun's oh, unloaded and yeah. safe and but like, yeah even just like watching the hunting videos you know to get the getting the correct mindset mm -hmm. that being comfortable like being able to spot the deer because you know i don't think i've ever shot a deer that saw me before I saw it. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, you have to be able to see that deer before it can see you. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you can have your uh, preparation going on. You know, when it gets past this tree, I'm going to pick the gun up. When it gets to that bush, I'm going to be ready on the other side when he comes through and, you know, think it through, have a plan. Yeah, that's also great, fantastic advice. But um, one, one other thing that you said that I think is, just one of the reasons that it kind of takes a lot of self-control to do this, same with bow hunting, same with, you know, traditional muzzle loading, anything that, that pretty much ups the challenge and, and decreases your range is setting your own personal range limitations. Because, you know, if, if you say, I'm not going to, I cannot reliably uh, and humanely dispatch something past 50 yards and then, you know, kind of this buck of a lifetime walks out at 75 yards, you got to be able to tell yourself no. And that's not easy yeah. at all. No, not at all. And it's kind of a catch-22 because if you're limited to 50 yards, shooting a deer 50 yards and closer is harder than past 50 yards mm -hmm. because as soon as that deer gets close, it just your, your movements are exaggerated. Mm -hmm. It's easier for the deer to pick up on them and, you know, it just the closer it gets, the faster your heart beats, and you're like, you know, your heart's trying to jump through your throat. And you're like, right. stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, trying to suppress that adrenaline, and and then when you get the shot off, then you know, just let it dump for all it's worth, and yeah. just enjoy the moment. That's funny. That that brings me. So uh, you said you're in in Maryland. What what's the typical hunting setup in Maryland? I'm always curious because I'm sure it's vastly different from where I am in Central Texas. Yeah, it's Maryland's. 
pretty diverse in that like I'm in central Maryland, which is the you know the the busy part of the state like I'm mm-hmm. twenty miles from d c mm-hmm. but then when you get to western Maryland, it's basically like the the panhandle of Maryland it hangs over into West Virginia for uh, ideal purposes they, they might as well just annex it to West Virginia because it, it's all in the Appalachian mountains uh. and then the eastern shore is all your watermen on Chesapeake Bay. And they're very rural. And it's funny, all the liberals in Maryland live in the central part of the state. Mm-hmm. All the, I say good people, <laughs> they <laughs> live on the uh, western Maryland and eastern shore. You know, the conservatives, the, mm-hmm. you know, your, your farmers, your chicken ranchers, yeah. your watermen, those kind of people. And those are your hunters. But it does provide some pretty liberal hunting seasons up until three or four years ago, like for does. It was unlimited, mm-hmm. like in my county and the surrounding counties. So we just had an abundance of deer, and there's, you know, they hide in these developments or mm-hmm. like these little, I don't want to call them a farm at, but like a, you know, a three to five acre mansion with that kind of guy. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. perfect for mm-hmm. deer. Yeah. And, you know, you could shoot a buck during the firearm season, muzzleloader season, and archery season. Mm-hmm. They've since cut that down to one buck, and then you can buy a bonus buck. Eggs. Mm-hmm. And they've limited the does to, I believe it's ten. But a lot of people are like, oh my god, ten deer. Yeah, that's still a lot. So it's it's pretty neat. And then if you go on the eastern shore, you know we have the uh, Sitka deer. Yeah, that adds it. And I know at one time they said if you hunted every county and took advantage of you know your buck does and Sitka deer and mm-hmm. whatever, you could kill like twenty six deer in a season. Wow. And then. Heck, around here, there's also the farm deprivation tags, too. I yeah. have a friend that he got in good with farmers, and, and he just, he's been killing a lot of deer, and he donates them, you know, to the mm-hmm. food banks and stuff because yeah. he, he just takes so many. But he's he's feeding a lot of people by doing that. He's also getting the farmers happy. Yeah. And he doesn't mind shooting flat tops, so. though. Yeah. We have uh, another m- member named Larry, Dr. Larry Rogers, who, in, oh, West, yeah. in West yep, Virginia, yep, yeah, the hitman, yeah, who, <laughs> man, yeah, he has, uh, he has quite, he has quite a count over the years of depredation, I, yeah. Isn't it something like he's, he's like over two thousand or something? Yeah, I mean it's something crazy in his lifetime, and then his groundhogs are, I don't know, yeah, out far. The what's to me what's almost crazier than the numbers is the fact that he kept all these records for. I mean, he is fastidious, yeah, man. Yeah. Another, he's such a great, he's such a great guy and he always is meeting people and posting about all this stuff. He's just such a cool, cool guy, but he also feeds a lot of people with that is when it uh, yeah. brought it to yeah. my mind. And I know he also, he goes out and visits Dick Thompson for uh, the mm-hmm. rock chucks in May. I mm-hmm. mean, he said he'll, he'll go out, you know, for a week and it's nothing for him to uh, knock out, you know, a couple hundred rock chucks. Yeah. 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 And he started, he said he started doing that cause he pretty much cleared out his normal hunting areas for being so successful over the yeah. years. And and what's yeah. funny about that is, you know, Dick said the rock chucks, they, they hibernate and they only come out for like two or three weeks out of the year. Huh. They come out, they feed, they mate, and they go back to bed. Interesting. How's that for a life? Yeah, I was going to say, what a life. <laughs> Man, geez. Well, so in, in Maryland, is it a lot of still hunting or do y'all do stands i mean i assume it's pretty... no it's all a stand yeah. you know for it's so congested here like pennsylvania mm-hmm. maryland um you know if you still hunted all you would do would be push the deer into some other person that's ah, in a stand gotcha so it's just you know you you get in 45 minutes before sunrise buckle yourself in and you know your opening day it's you know you stay all day from dark to dark Mm -hmm. and uh Mm -hmm. it just you know and of course the impatience of the other hunters that's what you usually your good times like nine o'clock is a great time because guys get tired of sitting for like three hours and they Mm -hmm. get up and start walking they get cold so they start pushing deer they get hungry they want to walk back to the car so they're yeah. pushing deer and then, you know, coming back after lunch, like about, you know, one or two o'clock in the afternoon is a good time. And then of course, you know, twilight. So, yeah, that's that one of my favorite maxims of hunting is, you know, how are you successful? You got to be out there and yeah, you have to be out there yeah. and, and around here, it's, it's, you have to be patient where mm. it's neat. Like out West and like Africa, it's all spot and stock. You know, you're, 
out west you find you know, a good vantage point and you're glassing around and you see something you know one or two miles away and you want to check to see how you're going to do your approach and mm-hmm. read the wind and, and go after it and then africa is kind of the same way you know you drive around and then oh there's something you bump it and then park the vehicle and you plan and stalk you know that way too right. so it's just it's different but it's it's a lot more fun it's easier when you're moving around i tell you to, to sit to hunt from a stand i mean it, it's some people can't stand it they hate it right tim sundle said because i will not hunt from a stand <laughs> from, he's from you know the owner of buffalo board yeah. uh, ammunition yeah. he said i hate it he goes, I want, you know i won't do it. i'd rather walk around and spot and stalk and not get anything than sit and stand all day uh, so in Texas, you know, we hunt from stands or blinds, we call them uh, a lot. Mm-hmm. And when I first started handgun hunting exclusively, it was the first time I also started spot and stalking around the hill country of Texas with a buddy of mine. Right. And, you know, for a couple of seasons, I was just like, man, I don't want to sit in the blind again. This is awesome, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I sat in the blind because I think it's a great way to teach new hunters. And I thought, you know, this is a skill too. <laughs> sitting still for yeah. hours at a time is a skill no, too it, yeah i mean it, it, it takes a mental toughness i mean it's there's no question especially when it's cold yeah you know, it just you just got to sit still you know do it and sit still and grin, grin and bear it well yeah thanks i know we didn't plan to talk about that but i'm always curious about people's home turf so um yeah moving in i mean you are you're you're a pretty prolific writer you write articles for fmg publications and you know i first saw you in American Handgunner because we share the same last name. And I was like, Hey, Uh you know, another Hoover, but, uh, a lot of Hoovers in Pennsylvania. And and, uh, yeah. Uh, funny note. Uh, you know, I have a standing deal with all of my friends and anybody I share hunting camp with. If you can find a new way to make fun of my last name, I'll buy you a drink. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You probably heard all the same oh yeah you know, oh yeah Edgar Hoover vacuum yes and, exactly uh, Herbert Hoover yep yeah yada 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 yeah that's funny and another funny thing Herbert Hoover and I have the same birthday so no kidding yeah wow. it's, it's just weird uh but anyway so knowing you from your articles and like I said being a general gun crank and you know someone who knows people in in, in the industry and uh, kind of is pays attention to that kind of thing I'm curious how do you think the industry and the, the gun media world perceive handgun hunting? Um, and I'll just say, you can't hurt my feelings if it's bad news, but I'm curious of what you think about it. You know, I've always wondered why they did, you know, the industry did certain things and I've come to learn it's driven by the almighty dollar, Mm -hmm. whatever sells, that's what they're going to make. And, you know, for the life of me, like I I love the the Thompson center line. Mm Mm-hmm you know, the contenders and encores. And when um, Smith and Weston bought them, I was like, oh man, this is going to be great. They're, you know, Smith and Weston, they have the pockets and the facility to be able to crank out these barrels and uh, frames and stuff. And, and they just sat on them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was so disappointed. And I kept, I'd ask around, I'd go, what's going on with this? What's going on with this? And they're like, hey, if we're not making it, it's because it's not selling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you said yourself, you know, with handgun hunters you know we're a limited lot and then when you go to the single shot route that even cuts it even more and i i just wish they would bring it back but i'm thankful that i got into it during the tail end of you know when thompson center was still making stuff you know you could buy a a used barrel on ebay for you know 125 Mm. 150 bucks and now the prices are just astronaut i mean i think a what a factory tc barrel is four or five hundred bucks i think going right now oh yeah depending on the caliber especially then yes I yeah mean, I've and seen them go for i think crazy ken money. kelly owns about half of them so. <laughs> yes i know <laughs> he does yeah I, every he's time got, i talk to him he's, he's like 20. every time i talk to ken he's like oh my god i got one of those oh my god i got one of those yeah. <laughs> i love that guy he, and it's and it's funny because they just seem to migrate towards them he, he does he'll yes. go to a yard sale or somebody comes in or a customer i want to trade this in you know and, mm-hmm. well i got a bunch but i think i might be able to work something out. that's so, so true so, but, that's uh, so true he's yeah. he's a great guy and i i tell you this, this is an interesting fact i want to get on i think guys would like to hear yeah 
we all know his dad, Larry Kelly. I mean, he's mm-hmm. he's like the handgunning god in my book. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's probably done more. And Ken told me one of the main reasons he wanted to be a handgun hunter, this is Larry, yeah. was, you know, the company was just in the outskirts of Detroit, Michigan. And there was a lot of handgun crime. And Larry said, I want to do something to show something positive oh. that can be done with handguns. Yeah. And that combined with, you know, promoting his Magnaport, mm-hmm. you know, that was it. But his main reason was showing something positive with, with handguns. He sure and as I heck just think did. That's a, yep. Forever and always, the, the member numbers for Handgun Hunters International, number one and number two, will be reserved for J.D. Jones and Larry Kelly because they were, yeah, you know, like godfathers And they, of that. you know, they were the best of buddies. Ken mm-hmm. said, oh, my God, I'd come in and, you know, Dad come in the office first thing. He got a cup of coffee and he called up J.D. and they'd have a 45-minute chat yeah. every morning. Man, that's great. I love those old touch points of history. Yeah. Yep. So um, back to the industry stuff, I, I get what you're saying about the whole the almighty dollar thing. That makes sense. You know, I, for a while I was in the production machine shop world and it is mm-hmm. just a dog eat dog world. And with the whole the popularity of the kinds of guns that are popular, you know, the ARs, the long range rifles, the carry guns, all of those all of those guns, it's, it's hard for them to keep up. I'm sure with that demand in order to kind of segment off some of the handgun hunting, but I am curious about like, so some of the, so like TC pretty much is, is defunct now as far as until, unless someone wants to buy it and revive it. But the, the whole people who do make hunting handguns that are, uh, like Ruger is a perfect example. I see that Ruger still makes these guns. I just don't see them as available because it doesn't seem they're making them in the quantities. Now I I know all the reasons yeah. about like they're harder to make, they're more time, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest thing I think with COVID just, mm. you know, they, it wiped out, you know, people quit coming to work and yeah. that just squashed in, in the, not just the gun industry, but right. every industry. And people started getting money for not working. And then people are like, well, why should I work when I'm getting a check for the right. same or more? Yeah. And uh, it just, it hurt, you know, those employees, but mm-hmm. or the, those manufacturers, because right. they just don't have the employees. And it just everybody I talk to that has a, a business, and this is gun and non-gun, it's like, I, I can't find people that want to work. That's a good And, you know, you point. need somebody to... to to put the stuff, you know, to make the stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're seeing, um, besides, you know, tax laws and stuff, but you're seeing uh, these come like Smith, you know, they moved down to Tennessee, you know, because, you know, Texas, that's a hotbed too that, you know, people are moving into. Mm-hmm. It's business friendly and, and people want to work. So, but yeah. yeah, if you don't have people making it, that, you know, what are, what are they going to do? That's a good point. I hadn't thought about the labor shortage. And I, I had a company making, um, rear grip pistol stocks for me at one time and they had to stop Mm -hmm. and I talked to them. It was the same thing. You know, why if people can get paid the same or more to stay home, why would they come to work? But yeah, that's a sad, that's a sad deal. Well, what about the, the media, Um, the media side of it? You know, um, do you know, do you know Larry Wysoon, the, uh, Mr. Whitetail? Yeah, I know. I know. I know of him. I've met him a couple of times, just, you know, cordial. Sure. Yeah. He, uh, he and I talked recently and he says, cause he does a, a TV show. I forgot, which I'm sorry, Larry, I forgot exactly which one he does now. Well, those, he's been um, on... Chasing the hunter's moon. Or, yeah. Or I think that's right. That one. And I don't know. If, but anyway, he said that when they, f- when they feature handgun hunting content, they always get such great feedback. So I'm just curious. And, and I know that American handgun, you know, uh, Mark Hampton, who is just a super, super nice guy probably the most yep. li- experienced living handgun hunter world traveled guy you know the guy yep. that we all call when it's like hey what's it like to hunt in you know i've never been there as stan but yeah right. so i'm just curious about especially like video media uh, I, I would think that because it's you know quote unquote more novel that it would draw more eyes what do you think the media uh, portion of this feels like you know i think like the the magazines that are geared towards hunting, the handgun articles are popular because it's something different. But like when I do something with FMG, and, and we encompass you know a wide scope of things, the hunting articles 
aren't as near as popular as some of the other stuff I write. Mm. And I think it's it's just I mean, obviously some hunters follow it, but I think there's a lot of people that there's a lot of gun people that don't want anything to do with hunting. Mm-hmm. And they would rather, you know, read about self defense or history of, you know, World War Two, you know, mm-hmm. surplus type stuff or or whatever. But, you know, and then like the hunting shows, I think the reason why handgun hunting would be popular is people it's obvious there's a challenge involved there and so it's like wow look at that that's you know i shot that because most people that have ever shot first time they shoot they go to the range and that you know they can't hit a target at 10 Mm -hmm. yards and they're Mm -hmm. seeing somebody knock a a deer or cape buffalo or whatever down at you know 75 80 100 yards 150 whatever the scenario might be right and they, they know how challenging it is yeah, I guess so. My question is, how come we don't see more of that? Probably because the people that have the names that are making these videos yeah. aren't handgun hunters. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, Larry's Larry's known for it, and he, he's done it. And But, you know, you think about it, like some of the hunting personalities on TV, and there's he's about it. Mm-hmm. And once you, you know, if it's your show or whatever, you know, these guys, they work hard and, you know, to get there and not to knock them, but, you know, there's just not many, you know, many, if at all, any handgun hunters. It's one of those things, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, because I right. kind of feel like how many people would we draw if it was out there more, which is kind of what Handgun Hunters International is trying to do. And versus are people just not interested because a lot of, you know, I've never, I've never introduced somebody to handgun hunting that they said, I'm not going to do that again. Right. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're going to drop the rifle or the bow or whatever it is. And I kind of feel also, you know, like you have said about the challenge of it, that these days, you know, with all of the things going on and the new generation being more interested in getting their own food, that they would want to pursue a more challenging way, which is, in my opinion, one of the reasons for the popularity, uh, resurgence of the popularity of bow hunting. But, uh, yeah, it's always a, it's always a nut I'm trying to crack. You know, um, something that's interesting, uh, I'm seeing, you know, on social media, there seems to be a, like a resurgence of, um, back, not backwood skills, but like the way our grandparents, like mm-hmm. people want to can, can, you know, jar their own food. They want to grow their own vegetables. They have their own chickens for their eggs. And I think that there is a market that we could gear towards those people Mm -hmm. because the next step is, okay, you're doing all this. It's it's time to, you know, take your own proteins and uh, learn how to whack a deer. And uh, somehow they need to target those people. And uh, I think, you know, it could be a way to to grow the numbers in the ranks. Yeah. Of of all kinds of hunting actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I just think it's, it's kind of neat that, you know, people, that people are kind of looking back, Because I tell you, it's just, you know, you look in the grocery stores and I started looking at it, you know, and it's, it's true. I mean, they they sell so much crap. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's so expensive as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Last thing I wanted to ask you about before we go, and um, this is another thing we didn't plan on, but access. Access is one of the things that I hear a lot about as far as where people can go to hunt, to shoot, you know, with uh, growing metropolitan areas. And, you know, where I am, we get little subdivisions in the middle of the country and they don't like to hear shooting, um, which doesn't mean that you can't because it's your property, but it does mean that you sometimes have to deal with a hassle. And I'm always of the mind that I'd rather bring those people into the fold than start a fight with them. But I'm, I'm curious right. as to, because we have two kind of groups in HHI. One is the group that has been doing it for a while. They have their setup. They have, you know, they've passed the, or are in the biggest income generating portion of their career so they can afford to do some of the more expensive trips or right. they're just locked down where they hunt. And then you have people who younger trying to get into it. Sometimes they have a young family and they're trying to, you know, afford all the stuff and then finding a place to hunt, especially in places where public land isn't all that easy to get access to. Right. I mean, that's that's probably more my bias than the actual truth of it, but I'm just curious of it, what you think about that. You know, it, it's kind of like uh, professional sports. It, that used to be the working man's entertainment, and now the working man can't afford to go. You know, right. to, you have to <laughs> watch right. the minor leaguers to go because tickets and, you know, the vending, you know, food and beverage, 
It's just astronomical. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I remember there was an older guy who told me, he said, hunting's going to become an elitist sport. It's going to be for the rich man. I'm like, nah, there's no way. And, going, you know, it's right because, like, where I'm at, there's a, there's a few farms. There's not many, but there are. And anybody that has land, they lease their land out to large groups to pay their taxes. And, you know, we, we have a big hunk of land not far from me. And it's a bunch of doctors and lawyers. They come down from Michigan. Mm-hmm. And it's like. You're coming down to Maryland to hunt, and you've got Michigan. <laughs> yeah, just... yeah. But you know that that's what's happening, and, and unfortunately, it's just the name of the game. But I mean, I'm fortunate that we do have um, public hunting here. Mm-hmm. But it's just you know, I, I won't go out during opening day because it's just you know crazy. You see right. the orange army out there, and yeah. I'll I'll just wait till you know the second or third day and hunt during midweek when nobody else is out. But it, it is, it's tough. I mean, it's, you know, uh, all I could say is, you know, you start knocking on doors and be polite and ask people permission and, you know, offer to do some yard work or you know, if you don't have the money, you know, cut their grass for the summer or, or paint their house or, yeah. you know, just, just do the barter system and, you know, you might get access. That's, that's really all I can offer. Yeah, that's a good, that's good advice. Okay. Before, before we go, can you, um, you can say no, but can you tell me, uh, some of the things you're working on now or excited to get a chance to work on as far as what you're going to be writing about <laughs> or, or putting on social media? You know, I, and I'm not putting you off Ryan, but that's fine. I kind of fly by the seat of my pants. Oh, I love it. I don't know what I'm writing from one day to the next. Like I, I sit around the hardest part about writing is coming up with an idea, mm. something that's original. And once you get that knocked down, that's 90% of the battle. Right. And I have about 10 things on my computer and files of just ideas where I started. So I don't forget them. Mm-hmm. And then as, you know, as time comes and I got to write something, I'll just snag one and just, you know, finish it out. And, uh, I'm, I, I hear you. I'm the same way, actually. I'm yeah. The same way. I, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I write my right. It's so varied work. And it's nice because it gives me a, a large field to choose from where, right. you know, I, I can, I can do a hand loading, a casting or you know, a new gun review or, you know, a hunting story or a goofy story or something funny when I was a cop, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, I'm all over there. I'm you know, kind of scatterbrained that way. But, um, it, you know, people, I think they, they like that. Like it's when you're sitting around read gun articles and all that stuff, it's, I think they enjoy the aspect of something that's just off the cuff and something that makes them chuckle or, you know, smile or, you know, tell the old story of, you know, hunting with your old uncle or yeah, um, absolutely. something like that, you know? So. Well, I think you just explained why you're interesting to read. <laughs> But that's well, great. I try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you always you always just kind of just throw it out into the ether and keep those fingers crossed, right? I know how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tank, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you sitting down to do this with me today. I'm I'm glad to have oh, finally got to pleasure. talk to you. I've you know, I've heard about you. I've read you for quite a while now, and I, I really appreciate you doing the podcast. We'll have to do a part two where we maybe can get into some more technical stuff. But uh yeah, okay. thanks so much Sounds for doing good. this. I really appreciate it, man. All right, thank you, Ron. Okay, everybody, make sure that you follow Tank Hoover on social media. Check out his articles in the American Handgunner and Guns Magazine. He's a very fan, fascinating writer. He's fun to read. He always has new and interesting stuff. For instance, I was reading an article that he wrote about making your own cast bullet mold because he couldn't find one that was available to make a specific bullet he wanted to. Very interesting article, easy to read, good pictures. Found that one online. Anyway, follow him. That was a that was another good episode. I had heard about Tank from some other HHI members, and I was just glad to have a chance to talk to him. And make sure you follow him. And thanks for listening to this episode of the Short Gun Sportsman. We'll see you on the next one. This podcast is produced by Handgun Hunters International. HHI is the only organization dedicated solely to supporting and growing the sport of handgun hunting. Membership gets you access to our great 
well-moderated forum where friendly handgun hunters of all experience levels share stories and information from folks that have actual experience in our sport. We also host giveaways to our members of guns, gear, and ammo every month, and each prize is worth several times what membership costs. In addition to this podcast, we publish a free digital magazine, The Six Gunner, which is written exclusively by HHI members. If you are a handgun hunter or support handgun hunting in any way, you need to be a member of HHI. Join today at handgunhuntersinternational.com. Again, if you have any questions on how to get started in handgun hunting, please reach out to me at ryan at handgunhuntersinternational.com. If you think we deserve it, please leave us a five-star review and don't forget to follow Handgun Hunters International on social media at handgunhuntersint. God bless and good hunting. Good hunting.